and some coaching content investors looking to build their business be more effective. Now, this is meant to be collaborative, so I hope you guys who are watching on the live Zoom participate. Um, we, we do this on Zoom. You can register at probateweekly.com. We also live stream it to YouTube, Facebook, and LinkedIn. If you're watching their live, feel free to, number one, say hi. Number two, put in your contact info, uh, whether you're on the Zoom or the uh, social medias. And three, also feel free to come in and ask questions, participate. The goal here, and the reason I started this, I don't sell a coaching product. I don't sell data. I'm a real estate broker. I have a team of uh, agents that I work with in Los Angeles and throughout the United States are building a national platform to build our business in real estate in the, in the specific niche of probate and related businesses. And so we're gonna to talk today about how you um, uh, build your team of people as you build your business. But again, I want you to feel free to jump in anytime. So the first question, I'd love to just put out the chat. If you're participating, put an answer in the chat box, you know, uh, put it on the comments if you're watching social media. Who here on the call has a team besides you? And if you do put me and the number one or 10 or 50 or however many people are on your team, I'd love to see the answers. Who here has a team and how many people do you have? And this is, I think, a ton question. I'm going to talk a little bit about the principles. There's a saying that you can go fast alone, but you can only go far together. And so we're talk about what that means and how to specifically I use. I'm going to share some of the things that I do. And then hopefully some of you who have successes will jump in and share some of the things you do. So anybody here want to answer? If you have a team, how many people do you have on your team? If it's zero, if it's just me, put just me. Uh, and I won't call you out by name. Okay, so Lee, Lynn says she's part of five active agents. Okay, thank you for uh, sharing that. Um, me, eight on our team. Uh, Jack is just me. Oh, Jack is not just you, junior family and every sporting uh, event between here and Mississippi, I think, or Indiana, I guess now. Um, okay, so I think we'll find, if, if everybody participated, I wish you all would, you make more money when you participate. But what I'll say is that whether or not you're a team has nothing to do with your legal format, right? Me and I have three buyers agents in my brokerage that help me show. Great, Shelly. So what I want to say is you'll often hear me talk about my team or our team. I, I say it all the time. Now, from a, from a company point of view, EXP uh, has different formats you can choose to participate. You, you can be your independent agent by yourself. You can be a, a domestic, I think it's called domestic couple team where you're married like, and you and your wife count as one, basically. You don't pay two caps or two fees. Then there's a um, something team with like, eh, usually smaller groups of people together and they hire new agents underneath them. And there's a called mega teams, mega icon teams. They have like, you know, hundreds of people underneath them. So there's all kinds of formats. And when we report a production up, we report it by as individuals or as teams for different awards. So I'll tell you that I am just me. Now I say I'm a team. I say people go, well, Bill, you know, you do a lot of business. You have a lot of things going on. I have a huge team. Uh, and that's the point of this. It's not about the people who legally sign a contract to work for me or in a brokerage, I guess, work in alignment with whatever the legal term would be. We have an attorney here, I have to be a little careful what that terminology is, but it's really how you approach people, right? And I'm gonna suggest to you that everybody should be on your team. If you had 8 billion people on your team, you're gonna win. And so what I want to say is there's many ways to organize, and I don't know your particular structure. I know personally, I don't want employees. Now, maybe part of it is I'm at 64 years old uh, with two grandkids now. Um, I'm making really good money. I've put a lot away. I just don't have the energy to put up with other people's stories much anymore, drama. I'm glad to help you, but if you're not going to help yourself, I just don't have the energy to put you on a 30-day notice and terminate employees. I just, and I'm in Los, I'm in Los Angeles, California, where in my experience is the worst place to have employees uh, in America. And so for a lot of reasons, I don't have employees. And I'm also trying to keep my business simple. And so it's simpler for me to either make agreements with agents individually and for administrative work to work on a contract basis. But that's my team. I have one TSA used primarily. I have 
seven other virtual assistants that do different jobs. I have um, uh, 20 agents that I've brought to my company, and another 23 that they've brought and turned to them for a total of 43. But none of them work for me directly. And unlike most brokerages, I don't collect commission from any of them unless I refer them business. That's a different, that's a transaction, not a team, right? So on almost all my listings, and I'm just sharing with you how I'm formatted, I will look for somebody to, uh, as a, uh, I call assistant listing agent format, for 10% of the commission, they do the work at the property. They'll uh, uh, make sure there's brochures, they'll meet the inspectors, the appraisers, the showings, the lock boxes, take the initial photos. There's certain work I've outlined for them to do in exchange for a small piece of the commission. And then they get all the buyer leads, and they can put their sign up if they want to get leads. Get a little complicated. My point is, each listing I do, I do vary who that is based on location, type of property, how their workload is. I've made it simple so all the team members are interchangeable. They're easy to replace. So if it was a vacation, I don't care. I've got four other people. I could pick somebody else and put them in there. The other thing is, in my structure, I use virtual assistants for all my administrative work. So often I tell people I'll do something. Like I have attorneys who ask me for deeds. I had one once. And he, he asked me for it. I sent it to him, like said to him within a little bit. And he said, Well, uh, Bill, if you have like an app or a person gets it for you, I'm glad to go direct. I said, No, no, I want you to call me. I, you know, yes, I have people. And yes, I'm not spending all day long on my computer getting documents and email. I'm not going to do hours of administrative work. I have people do it for me, but I want you to call me. And so the key is to find people to delegate to. Now, that's a different topic I do on delegation and how to do $400 hour work and delegate out anything below that or certainly below $100 an hour work to somebody else. That's a whole different discussion. Recently, I had to get a lockbox where I live in West LA to Sunset, I, I, you know, Sunset Strip area. So back and forth, if I just drove there and back, it's probably at this time of day, it's probably about an hour drive, assuming I find the person drop off the box. And I hired a delivery service just to go there. It cost me 30, 40 bucks, but saved me an hour for 30, $40. Another example is, you know, on a personal, my wife, fortunately, is now cancer free. For the last year and a half has been fighting cancer. Numerous doctor's appointments. And I would ask her, do you need me to take you emotionally? I'll do it. Do you need me to take you physically? Of course, I'll do it. Do you need me to take you um, um, safety wise, like I said, at night, I'll do it. But if you just need a ride, let's use Uber because I can't really afford to be an Uber and I can't drive you and come back and then pick you up and come back. That's two rides where I could for $20 have somebody else do it properly. So that's different delegated work. My team is all those people, right? And I want you to think of that the goal here is we're looking to build a business, not a job. And I will tell you, even if you just have a job, let's say you say to me today, well, I work, you know, full-time at wherever, Macy's or Google, I work part-time in real estate. I would say, take the attitude. My mentor taught me when I came out of college, no, you're in business for yourself. You just rented out yourself full-time to the employer, 40 hours a week or whatever terms you make with your employer to one customer. And they're going to pay you on a W-2, you're going to pay taxes and all, all that that means. But if you take the attitude that you're a business, and even when you're an employee, you're really a business, you just made yourself an employee for that business. Then you start looking at your time differently, and the value of your time becomes greater because you can make money. I can make money. Anytime I call people who confirm me business, I make money. That's my basic job. I'm the rainmaker of my business. And I will say one last thing, I'm gonna get my soapbox a little bit. A lot of people in real estate talk about teams, in my opinion, particularly some of the, I want to badmouth another real estate company like Keller Williams, where I used to work. I don't want to say their name and embarrass Keller Williams, but I feel like a lot of these companies have these training programs that really are almost enslaving agents back to the broker or the team leader. And the teams are run for the benefit of the team leader rather than for the individual. Whereas really, when I did employ people when I was younger and had the ambition to do that, I always looked at employees as important resources. Our job was to make them more valuable by teaching them, helping them grow. 
and and the the value of success was the employees growth and if they went to other places within our network an example i ran a large brokerage and the owner didn't allow top agents to hire our frontline staff like the receptionist and the admin staff i said that's crazy of course we want our brokers to hire our staff because our staff knows our ways and then our top brokers are our top agents will stay with us so I would tell you that a team in my concept is about everybody winning. And if you can help everybody win, right? I have a TC, for example. I want her to have more business when she wants it. She's busy. She has way more business. I'm not going to market her. But if she does, my job is to help her be more successful. Let me ask you, when I do that, when I help get business to my TC, when I call her, do you think she takes care of me? Yeah. She might put your file down and work on mine. And frankly, I don't care if you want her attention, you give her more business too, then we'll both win, right? Let's both help her. So a team is not a way to slave others. A team should be a way to build synergies and win. So let me just cover those five kind of mindsets before we get into the details. Because otherwise the details won't make sense. How do you build a team? On your own, you can go fast, but together you can go far. If you want to go far, you need other people to help you be successful, number one. Number two, there's a lot of different for formats. Don't get stuck on the format. Now, I'm kind of creative and um, I'm educated and I've been around a while. So you always should start by copying a format or a, a, um, a template and then adjust it to yourself. But there's a lot of ways to do it. Don't get stuck on this is the only way to run a business. Many real estate agents get to a brokerage and think, well, that's the only way to run it the way they see it. You understand there's many ways to run a business. I'll never forget when I left, I, I was a broker, um, general manager for a seven branch office I helped build. And when I left him, I met an, one of the other leading owners called me to interview me. And his business was totally different. Our business was Mike Ferry, phone calling. We had call centers set up in the office. His office was based on printed material. He had a huge, he had like a, a printing company within his real estate company. And he used that to give marketing material to his agents, right? Flyers and mailers and stuff. And he had a staging company and he had a whole methodology and how to use that, right? That they would give the staging for free if they did the listing and then they adjust the listing it was free every 30 days. If they cut the price by 5%, he had a whole system behind it. I had never seen business done that way. It was eye-opening to learn a new format. So I want to just tell you, don't get stuck on the structures. Many ways to organize. Three, I showed you how I do my business with, with it's just me. I mean, I'm in a room, there's nobody around me. My wife is outside, but I have a team, but we get a lot done. You know, we, I'm closing 25 or 30 deals myself. I have 43 total agents are closing deals. I have events going on. I show, I have events I show up at. I did nothing all month, but show up because my team's running that for me. Four, it's about building a business, not a job. And even if you have a job, it's about building a business. You just aren't paying attention. And fifth is, a team is a way to empower other people. It's not a tool to enslave others. You don't build a team because other people are going to work hard and make you money so you can not work hard. It doesn't work that way. Great leaders are at the front. Great leaders are leading the troops, not falling behind troops. Bad leaders are always back at headquarters while the troops are suffering and they don't know what's going on. And so those are the five mindsets I would think about. But I want to give you the concept. When I say, how do you build your business? How do you build it, building your team? The team is part of the concept of what I call leverage. So what's leverage mean? Anybody want to explain to me in real estate, how do you create leverage in your business? Right, A lever is something that you, you put in some effort and it gets amplified twice, three times, 10 times. How do you, in real estate, what are ways that we can leverage our time? Anybody want to share? Anybody? How do you create leverage in real estate? Unmute yourself or raise your hand or put in the chat box. If you're watching online, we've got a bunch of people on YouTube, shout out in Facebook, feel free. If you're watching along, put questions in the, in the box. Everything says, fix my background. I'm not sure what that means. Is there, is there something particular in my background I'm, I'm not aware of? How do you create leverage? Anybody want to share? Is it just me? Peter's part of my team. I talked to Peter and he goes to the courthouse in Orange County and brings me back great information. Peter, how do you create leverage in real estate? 
Um, I think to create leverage is um, for me is to create value in myself and and leverage the tools, whatever tools I have around me to kind of get what I need. Okay. So there are two concepts. One is your skills is a le lever, right? The more skilled you are, the more value you create for the people, the more business you get. Mm -hmm. And second, there are tools. Some tools are levers. Some tools are time sucks, correct? Yes. As real estate agents, we are constantly bombarded with sparkling new tools. Every day, I must get three texts offering me leads. And they and they they can't come out and say what they really are. They have to lie about it. Well, they're not gonna say, well, pay this and we'll give you this many leads, or pay this percentage, we'll give you leads. I'm not just buying leads from anybody. They have to act like they're gonna refer me a listing. I kind of play along sometimes because I know where it's headed. But we get offered sparkly toys, but we have to realize there's real tools and levers, and then there's fake. One of the tools is people. The more people we talk to, the more people we create value for the more successful we'll be because we can create more value for our customers. So when I say your team, when I wrote this out, I said, well, how many people are really on my team? So I started making a list, I categorized them. So let me just share with you how I look at my team. And I want you to think of your business with a similar team or, or tell me I'm wrong if, I'm, if you think I'm off track here. So the first category of my team is within transactions, I have a bunch of people. I have a transaction coordinator. Uh, I only use one in particular. You could use a couple, split them up, whatever. I just try to keep it simple. I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. One of my eight, one of my top agents in my group, Annabelle Pacheco, joined our company, needed a TC, and I introduced her to mine. But six months later, she called me on the phone one day and said, hey, Bill, I have, and I remember her name, to be honest. I have Mary on the phone with me. I go, yeah? She goes, you know, Mary. I'm like, no, who's Mary? She said to me, no, you know Mary, you talk to her all the time. And I said, who? I don't talk to Mary all the time. What are you talking about? She said, Mary's your TC. And I said, Annabelle, you don't understand. I've never talked to her. I only communicate through email because a TC in my book, I want to communicate as efficiently as I can. It has to be very good at taking instructions via email. I had never talked to Mary. If I did, I don't remember. I never talked to her on the phone. I never saw her on a Zoom call. But I closed like 100 deals with her. I didn't really care to talk to her. I'm not looking for any more female relationships. I'm married. I have a daughter. So I, I, have, I have enough, right? But my point is that she's part of my team. I look at her as a team. How's your workload? How are they treating you? Um, and then uh, the company I'm with, XP, had an in-house department. And they closed it down. And so I hired her externally to do my work. And I ask her, hey, we have a market event. You're welcome to come for free. I offer her what I might charge a vendor as an advertiser because I want to help my team member build her business. I recently referred her some business and she gave me a thank you. She discounted the fee. Like, I remember what it was, $25, $50. It was very nice, but that's not why I do it. Why do you think I, I want to refer her business? Why do you think I would refer the, the uh, my TC business? Aren't I worried that she might be too busy for me? No, can I tell you what happens when I call? I am sure if there's a stack of other people's files, including yours, she pushes them aside and pulls mine out because she knows I'm, she's gonna get paid, I'm gonna treat her right, and I'm gonna bring her some business. That's what you want team members to do. So one's, one of my team members is my TC. Another team member that many of you don't think of as your team member is my broker. Why is that? Now, in my case, being a probate agent, we I have more difficult and different transactions than any other realtor, uh, than a standard realtor, right? Because probate adds a layer of complexity. It adds uh, legality to it. It adds attorneys. It adds drama. It adds non-interested parties, heirs and such. So I've come to invest time with my broker where they, you know, I, I do training for them for free. I Whenever they ask me for anything, I get them. I always make a point of saying hello to them. I put time into that relationship. So when I need something, I get the benefit of the doubt, right? And I need that as I build my team, I want to be that connector. That one sounds obvious. Another one in terms of paper should be an attorney. I have multiple that I can call. When I have a question on how things should be done in probate or in real estate, we have, it, as a realtor, you have the California Association of Realtor Attorney hotline 
every member gets that for free. But sometimes I have questions specific to probate that they're not going to handle. So I have attorney friends I'll call and say, hey, I have a question. I'm working on this angle. Can you help me with it? They're glad to help me because I'm part of the team with them. So we shall have attorneys that can help us train. Now, how do you earn that? By giving them referrals, by giving them business. I also have team members who help me with the property. In my case, I have a team member who does you know, the sign or the sign writer if they want to do it or brochure box. They handle the showings, they have the inspections, they meet the appraiser, they meet the, I refer them to buyer leads and they handle all the buyers. Another one is all the reports, a transaction. Who's your title company? Right? It's interesting to me when, when agents call me, I'll say, well, you need to get the deed. Now I could pull up deeds across America because my team member gives me access to certain reports. But I want to encourage you as agents, you all should find a title representative who's more than just a rep and don't settle for ball game tickets or coffee or donuts or something stupid like that. I'm running a business. I want the title rep who's going to help me generate business. I got into probate initially because of title rep, Kevin Sales, um, a lawyer's title. Uh, I, I brought him in to train my agents and I just was fascinated by the concept before I even did production myself in probate. Uh, the title rep helped me. You know, I didn't ask him for money or co-sponsoring or party or whatever. I made a lot of money because he helped me and I helped him, right? How about your escrow? Or if another state's your closing attorney? Are they a team member? Are they just somebody that you have to deal with once in a while? Well, what would treating them like a team member look like? If you took that relationship, instead of I have to open escrow somewhere, I have to open a closing somewhere, to what would it what would life look like if there was somebody in our case escrow in California in other states closing attorney what would it look like if that person felt like they were your partner in your business NHD reports where do you get those from who's your vendor in my case I don't really have anybody who sells them but my escrow officer has a friend who does them so between the vendors I say whoever you like because my escrow officer is my team member Right. And she has her NHD person who is her team member. How about home warranty? Now I'm a listing agent primarily. So most of my buyers and most of my buyers are investors, don't buy warranties. But on the listing side, they will offer the warranty to start for the seller before the close of escrow, from the day of listing. They can prorate the warranty, take it off close of escrow, and the seller hasn't paid for it. But that way the coverage started under the seller. So the bar moves in, all of a sudden the air conditioning, air conditioning doesn't work. It's presumed it's been working while the seller was there. So the warranty becomes one of my partners. I recently interviewed uh, Choice Home Warranty as my warranty partner on my YouTube channel. Why? I want to promote her business. Why is that, Bill? Because when I call her, I want you to put you guys on hold to take my phone call. Nothing personal. <laughs> and I want to put everybody's on call, call on hold. I'm trying to sell some houses here. So again, those are the people regarding the trend. Who did I leave out? Anybody else have partners related to the transaction that I left out? I can just cover it. TC broker, attorney, cars attorney. Uh, who's going to go to the signs, showings, and, and meet inspections and that stuff? Title, escrow closing, NHD, and warranty. I just named nine potential team members that you all should have on your team. Did I leave anybody out regarding transactions? Jack Lapidus. And, and this may not fall under so much for what you do. I, I think it's important in almost every real estate transaction, especially if you don't have great contact with the current owner, surveyor. Interesting. Uh, especially in West LA, because in West LA, where they put up the fences, the property lines were mere suggestions. Yeah. And so sometimes you, you want to get get a surveyor out there to figure out is the fence actually on the property line because if if you're if the fence is uh five feet over or even two feet over and then you buy this property you may be buying litigation where the person would go well i want to take down the fence and put it on the property line well that might be in the middle of your driveway if you're if your garage is in the backyard so in almost every case that I deal with, there's two, two people I reach out to, which is I get a title 
company to get a, a copy of the most recent deeds or sometimes all the deeds and a surveyor to at least go out and eyeball for me and make sure the fences are relatively close to where they need to be. You know, you, then you triggered in my head, of course, the AC heater guy, the termite guy, the sewer inspection guy or gal, the handyman guy or gal, all those other vendors, all those other people. And so what I've always done my whole career is when I meet that person, I get their business card or they call me now or email me. I put them in my social media and solicit them for referrals. They're part of my business or part of my team. And when people say, do you know somebody I have in my database, I can easily refer them out. I try to interview them on video. So when people ask me, I can, I can send an email with them with the interview that I did for just today. I was talking to an attorney who does um, probate administration and needs a connection to a great banker who can help him some specific things in probate. And I happened to have interviewed a great banker. I think the best banker for that business is American Business Bank for doing what are called joint control accounts. And I made the introduction, but I also had interviewed um, that banker and sent the YouTube with him so he could see the guy in, in interview. Why? Because I want him to use my banker because my banker is part of my team. I didn't, I, you know, I didn't have that on there, but that's kind of general business banker. I'm going to add that to my list. Here. I'm making, I do these calls really for myself as much as you guys. I've, you, you know, true confession here. Uh, I'm hope, hoping I'm learning here as, as I'm going along, but again, they become part of your team. My job is to feed them. So in turn, they're going to feed me. Just got a phone call today from somebody who's like a real estate coach who I'd sent some referrals to called me today with a probate lead who's saying to me. So we want to create a team and I'll do it so that I get referrals. I do it to help them knowing somehow the business comes back to me. I don't really worry about it. Okay. Now the second area I made a list of, of uh, team members is specifically related to probate. Meaning in probate, we have a whole nother cast of characters that we add to our list that we should be looking for the opportunity to add them to our team instead of looking at them as some mystery piece or that we don't understand. So for example, I listed off the probate bond company. Any of you have a probate where your seller is selling the house, any listing, whether it's full authority or limited, you know, a good number of them, not all of them, sometimes the bond's waived. If in the will, it waives bond and they qualify, the bond is waived. But I would say most of the time in a probate case, even a minimal bond is needed. Have you met the bond company? Particularly out of Los Angeles. The LA is a very big consolidated company, but in smaller areas, there's usually a guy or gal that goes to the court, networks with the judges, networks with the attorneys, goes to the bar meetings from a bond company. It's like a to um, it's a it's a bond to guarantee the administrator, executor, uh, in case anything goes wrong, they cover them for um, I don't know what the exact range of coverage is, but shortages or mistakes or things like that. Bond company, probate advance company. I've had some on this call. A critical piece, but again, it's not just my customer needs money. It's this person should be part of my team. I want to interview them. I want to promote them. I want them to think of me as a key member of their business. So when they have referral, who do I want them to call? Everybody together? I want them to call me. And you want them to call who? Me. No, you want them to call you, of course. So how do you do that? You do that by creating value for them. So uh, probate advance company, obviously attorneys. Now, one of the big mistakes, I actually interviewed Jack Lapidus, I remember it was on this call or the real estate investing call about uh, referring to attorneys or working with attorneys. And commonly people, and I watch it happen to them all the time, will say, oh, I need an attorney. Oh, well, there's Jack. He does everything with real estate. No, he doesn't. And I think that you miss the opportunity when you get a lead rather than just throwing out a name, because I'm going to tell you, if you ask me to, to respond to that, hey, I need a probate attorney, nine or 10 times, I would pick the wrong person because it's no different than a doctor with a patient walking in the room saying, oh, here's a surgery for you. Or based on how you're walking, here's what we're going to do. You know, we're just going to do some heart surgery on you. You need to find out, well, exactly what's the issue here? What are you trying to do? What county is it in? What's the customer like? How much money is involved? All those are going to narrow down to the right attorney rather than just one. So you need to have, I think, at least three attorneys in your Rolodex. And probably in each of those three, 
one in every geography you work. And maybe also um, male and female, because people work better with one or the other, or how rush you and split it up. But you need three, a probate administration attorney, a probate litigation attorney. Now this is true if you're in California, and then a probate avoidance attorney, AKA an estate planning attorney. So any state, you need two of those three. In California, for sure, you need probate litigation. I literally today was talking to a leading probate attorney who does estate planning, who does not do litigation. And he was asking me to help him find people for litigation cases too. Very hard to find. Probate litigation is a very narrow field, very specialized. But still, wouldn't you like to have attorneys call you with that problem? Like I take those calls all day long. I, I would book myself at my desk eight hours a day filling those phone calls. Right, having attorneys calling me for help because I want to be the value to them. So those are three you need to have, and that way when people say, "Hey, I need an attorney in probate," tell me a little bit more. What are you trying to do? You're trying to avoid probate? Is there is there a trust you know involved, and you need to work through the trust or, or or issue a new trust or whatever it might be? Another group of people we deal with is is real estate agents is paralegals. I just can't tell you how often I talk to agents and ask them, they'll ask me questions about something. And I'll say, well, do you talk to attorney? No, whenever I call, I just get the paralegal. Well, who do you think really does the work? Let's be honest. I mean, the paralegal doesn't go to court and talk to the judge, but who does all the other work? Who do you really think does all that? And I'm gonna put down attorneys. I'm talking about the work that we normally see is not really the attorney's work. It's his product. He's responsible for it or she. I say he, I imagine myself, but he or she. But really, what, at the phase we're in probate, usually it's just the paperwork. That's the paralegal. The attorney has designed the game plan, maybe, and advised the client of the game plan and executed at court. But the paralegal really runs the, the paperwork and the process. So don't tell me you can't get the attorney. Talk to the paralegal. Now, a lot of attorneys these days use virtual paralegals, paralegals in other countries. Those other countries are on different timelines. All that's complicated, but at least make the effort to find out. Literally last week, I was referring an attorney to a probate paralegal to help him because he somebody has paralegals way behind and stuff isn't getting done right. He's frustrated. I refer him to somebody to help, help with that. Next, court personnel. Now, on the another call I do on Tuesdays for probate mastery, we have Courtney on who lives in, I think it's Virginia, if I remember correctly. Um, who he went to court and good looking guy, young, energetic, million dollar smile. And he just hit off with one of the court employees. Well, how valuable is that? Like I literally, I'm on the phone with attorneys. I can't get a hold of the court department. Well, if you knew the gal that worked in that office, not in LA, LA is a different market. LA, our government is, is different. But in most places where the government officials treat you as decent human beings. Um, the court, the judges are great. The court personnel in the room are great. It's the administrative people on the outside that are, you know, difficult. In other counties, you can walk up to the desk where you file documents and they'll help you answer questions, right? How valuable is that? Peter was in Orange County. You know, that was your experience, right? Just down the road a bit. So the court personnel, they're part of your team. I mean, I, are you ever going to go back again? Yeah. Next time you go back, bring her a Starburst card. Thank you. I used to bring candy at Christmas time. I bring uh, C's candy boxes. And I had a bunch in my briefcase. I didn't carry them. I wouldn't be able to see them. I wouldn't feel like it was special. I brought this for you. I just want to say thank you. And I gave one to the sheriffs. I gave one to the, the, uh, the people in the uh, research room. Um, and then also another potential partner is how do you get documents? Now in LA, again, a little different. For probate, you got to go to downtown to, to um, Stanley Mosque and stand in line and get the documents or use a document service. Which one do you do? You need to have one of those solutions. Either you got to go, you got somebody else who's going to go, or you have a service that's going to go. Those are your three choices. There can't be a fourth, which is there's a document I need to get to close my escrow and nobody's ever going to pick it up. That's not an option, I'm, I'm presuming. So I have a service. I had an attorney last week who said, well, gee, we need to get this document right away. Can you help me? Sure, of course, I can get to you in 24 hours. And he said, yeah, just send me the invoice for it. So it was beautiful. I just went online. It took four minutes to order the document pickup. And to the attorney, he would have had to call his paralegal, who knows if she's available. I just got it done. Or an attorney who refers me, you know, 
I, I have so far about two and a half, no, $3 million worth of probate business. How many times will I order for document pickup for him? As long as he wants. He's part of my team and I'm part of his team. And the legal service is part of my team. Is this helpful? You guys getting a picture? My goal here is expand your, your, your thinking, right? From I'm just this guy on my own to know everybody's part of my team. They all can help me and I can help them. And if I help them, they'll help me more. So number three uh, area of team members is business people, right? Who's your accountant? I, I uh, went with an accounting company that actually promoted me on a real estate event with hundreds of people online. And as a result, there used to be a couple of really, really good people. I haven't got any business out of it yet, but that's how business it works. It's just time. You keep working at it. In fact, it turns out one of the, the uh, managing partner of a big law firm that is probate also knows my son-in-law who's at a wealth management company because they're also, they do business together. So who knows how that works out, but your accountant, are they helping you with your business? Does your accountant do probate or trust accounting? One of the toughest things that stumble um, administrators and executors is the accounting. Just keeping track of the invoices and putting together uh, a simple spreadsheet of the accounts. Obviously some accounting is more complicated than others. Some are simple, but even simple accounting has to be done. And then accountants need bookkeepers. I have a bookkeeper. Does your bookkeeper help you with your business? I don't keep my own books now. I have a bookkeeper who does it for me. And I, but I also want things done a certain way. She's part of my team. How about investors? I don't mean investors in your business. I mean investors you work with, people who are looking to buy and sell property. Certainly they're, they're customers too, but they're also partners in that they help me get business. They help introduce me to people. So I want to help them. There are times that I refer them business. I have nothing to do with it. I'm not going to make any money on it. Why is that? Because we're part of a team. And if they, they buy more properties and fix and flip, I get more listings. It just works out that way. And then when I added, I just thought on this call uh, earlier, was a banker. Where do you bank? Now, I used to bank at Wells Fargo because I would often go to court and need a cashier's check. And Wells Fargo, there's two near me, and they're easy to park, go in and get a cashier's check. But now I don't do that business as often. So I'm thinking, well, maybe there's another banker will come along that I can, they'll appreciate my business. And I can also refer them business. And that's what I've been doing now with this new bank I'm working with. So the banker is part of my team. The, lot, the next category is. Real estate agents. So those of you who are agents on the call, I often, as, as recently as two days ago, have agents say to me, I don't want to put them in my database because they're agents. I was at a conference where they're training agents how to use YouTube. And they said, we're not going to give you our channel because we don't want you to subscribe to it because we don't want our channel with agents. We want our channel just with consumers. And I thought, well, that seems silly. Number one, real estate agents buy and sell houses more than anybody. They're investors, typically, they're more likely to have second homes, more likely to have to buy homes. Number two, referring business in and out of the area. Number three, their customers, if you go into YouTube or Facebook and you, you connect, your customers kind of start to become their customers, right? We've all seen that if you're on YouTube, they'll say, oh, so-and-so also liked this video. So of course I want realtors to like my videos. Of course I want them to be in my social media. I'm gonna give you the opportunity to do business with me. At the same time, if you're not active, maybe you retire, maybe you're out of the business. So of course I want as many people as possible. So part of it is just working together that way. I also on my, on my team have agents that show property for me. There's a, a, an app I use called Show Me, where you go in, if I need to show property, I don't show it. I don't show property basically. There's exceptions, but it, of the last hundred houses I've sold in the last few years, I've shown two because it's just not productive driving there and back or showing people property. I'll make an appointment and then have an agent show up and show them the property. But now that the agent's in my system, they're part of my team. I want them to give my customers better service than the other agent's customers. I want them to know who I am. 
Another one is cooperative agents. When you're a listing agent, how do you treat the buyer's agents? I try to treat them all like customers. Generally, I'll double in my own deals. So I want to get all their information. I want to put them in my system. I want to stay in touch with them. I want them to appreciate me. I've had other agents refer me listings. Hey, Bill, I got this listing. I can't quite get it. I'm not a probate expert. Can we co-list it? Yeah, I do that all the time. But it's more than just that. It's also, I want every one of you, when you see my listing, oh gosh, this is great. I can sell one of Bill's listings and learn how to do probate from him on a deal. I, I would love that. But you really want all of their, you want, you want their support in one way is treat them like their prospective customers, not like competitors. The truth is we on, the, we on this call today, 20 or so live on Zoom, another 20 or 30 between Facebook and YouTube, and well, about 200 will watch this in the next week total. So people say, well, Bill, you're training competitors. No, I'm training my team members. There's 200 agents who are gonna watch this and there's a million agents in the United States who aren't. There's 100,000 agents in LA. If we get all the business, well, who besides me would like, if we got all the business in LA, who'd be okay with that? If we got all the business in California split up amongst us? Okay, I thought you guys would be okay with that. I'm okay with that. My hand's up. What? How did my hand go up? That's weird. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, Jack Lapis has his hand up. Yeah, so I get a ton of referrals from other lawyers. And I know it's different for real estate agents. But I talk with real estate agents because uh, I represent a lot of them. And I said, do you look at other agents as competitors or potential partners? And they say, oh, competitors. I said, well, what, if you're on one side of the deal and there's an agent on the other side of the deal, are you guys working together or are you enemies? They go, well, they're enemies. I'm like, okay, how do you reconcile that to when you're a dual agent? It's like, oh, yeah, actually we should be working together. When I'm in litigation with another attorney, I'm working with that person to resolve the case. When I'm, you know, I have a bunch of other real estate attorneys and we all refer to each other because for whatever reason, it's too big, it's too small, I'm busy, I'm not busy, whatever. And it's very much the same with real estate agents where, you know, they're too busy, they're not busy enough, they're the house, it's too big, it's too small. I don't like working with that probate attorney. I don't like working, you know, Oh, that judge drives me crazy. So I'm going to hand it off to that person. And it's not, even though it feels like it, it's not a zero sum game. Everyone can make a bunch of money off of it. And, and sometimes it works out better if you g give something away to someone else. And then down the road, there's going to be something they're going to think of you first when they have something to give away. Right. Well said. I've always patterned myself I, as a client. I had a case 30 years ago. And attorneys were so friendly, it drove me crazy because I because I hated the guy who was suing me. He was just he was a philanderer, he was a cheat, he was a liar, he was a bully. And at the end of the day, I, I got some money from him, I didn't lose anything. But the attorneys were so friendly, it just drove me crazy. He said, Look, Bill, we've got to get along, or else if we're fighting, it's gonna make it worse, it's gonna cost you more in the long run. Like we have to communicate. And I always feel like there are times. Unfortunately, when I get an agent who's dishonest, I need to protect my customer from them. Then, yeah, then I'm going to throw down. Like, if you want to go, go to the mat, let's go to the mats because my job is to protect my customer. But 99 of 100 or you know, 80 of 100, I want to be cooperative. I want the other agent to like me and trust me. And, and I want to put deposits in that relationship early to try to get through the process. I really work hard in the beginning to make an assessment, and if I can, be as friendly as I can to them. Now, the problem is once somebody shows you their teeth, you have to treat them as, once I realize somebody is just dishonest, man, then you have to just scrutinize everything. But Jack has 100% right. And I think watching attorneys work gave me an idea of what's possible. And I wanna say as realtors, we're the ultimate cooperative business. The existence of the MLS is two guys got together and said, I've got this listed, you got that listed, Let's put together and also try to sell each other's listings. Well, that makes sense. That's all the MLS is. It's us. We own They're called it. cooperating brokers, aren't they? Well, that's what they're called. <laughs> a lot of things are called a lot of things, but yeah, they're called exactly. That's the term cooperating brokers for a reason. 
So why not make the effort to go another step? I'll give you a little tip. And I, I hope I'm not giving away a secret here that would make it less special. If you guys ever saw my listing, but I'll tell you that every time I ever sell a property, I send a gift to the buyer's agent and just say, thank you. Usually it's a book that I find inspiring. Generally it's, it's Grant Cardone's 10X book because I, I think it could change people's lives and I want to send something. But over the years I've changed it. That's the current one. I just send them a little thank you note and have the book you know, delivered to them as a thank you. Not a big deal, it costs a lot of money, but it's something to say, I appreciate the time we spent working together. I didn't have to do it, right? Because what do you think next time that person, I had an agent one time call me. It's so funny. We closed the deal and she called me like a week or two later. I had to put her name together because her name was fairly common. Um, and her name was very common. And uh, she said to me, by the way, you have a problem in your listing, blah, blah, blah. She was like my eyes and ears. I'm thinking, she said, you don't remember me, do you? I said, no. She said, I'm the buyer's agent that sold your listing at blank. I'm like, oh, wow. It's so nice of you to call me and tell me. Why do you think she did that? Because we're like friends. I never met her. Never even saw her. Okay, here's another group you guys are going to find funny. All the colleagues at your brokerage. They're all part of your team. Now, you, you get kind of sucked into the team, into the broker's team. But you need to suck them into your team. What do you do to create value for your colleagues that they want to do business with you? I don't mean just going to the staff meetings or the company parties, and I do do that. But what do you do to, to promote a relationship with you in the business on top of that? And there's a lot of different ways you can do that. You can teach classes. You can offer value. You can be the person who shares your, your content with the other agents in the office that's helpful. Right. And I would say find something you're known for, like probate, maybe, and share that with your other agents in your office or your brokerage. Be the resource so that when you're, and I'm going to tell you, most of your brokers who, if you're not an XP, most of your brokers don't know what they're talking about in probate, having talked to many of them. Be the resource so that your broker calls you and says, hey, Peter, hey, Joe, you know, I know you do, you've been doing a lot of probate. I know you've been uh, learning a lot about it. I got a question. Can you help me with it? Now, you may not know the answer, but you know the guy who might have the answer for you or the guy you can point to the answer, right? You want to be the person, you may not be the person, but you want to be the person that call that either is the person or gets the person. Does that make sense? Oftentimes on the training on the probate mastery and before that, all the leads, they teach you should build your Rolodex before you start. I say wrong. Prospect, and as you meet people, put them in your Rolodex. You call, you talk to somebody, you meet them at a network event. I do um, plumbing. Now you got your plumbing contractor guy. Call him, meet him, have coffee with him, whatever your methodology is. I would interview him on a video, post my social media, share his business, right? So when people need plumbing, they're gonna call me. They're not gonna remember the plumber. They're gonna say, hey, Bill, I saw you interviewed a plumber two months ago. I need a plumber, can you help me? Yeah, I want to be that guy. I don't know anything about plumbing. I do turn water on and off and I do flush, but I don't know how the pipes work, but I know a guy, right? So you want to be the resource to the agents at your office, at your brokerage, at your company. I create a group at EXP for probate internally, and we have almost 3,000 members in that group. And the good news is we get to share content together. We get to share ideas together, share leads together. And last is networking with other agents. So many of you go to networking events, you meet somebody, you try to figure out what they do, and then you discover they're an agent. Ah, they're just another agent. No, they're a human being. They're a human being. They're a person. And there's multiple ways that you can do business together over time. If you look at that opportunity, maybe they go out of business and they need to refer to somebody that they trust and like. Maybe they move out of the area. Maybe they hire you on their team. Maybe you bring them in your office as a buyer's agent. I don't know, but you don't know until you start the relationship. And so I want you to get the concept that everybody, everybody is part of your team. And, and so when people call me sometimes they say, so people, so Bill, how many people are on your team? I always have a tough time to answer that question because, you know, from a legal perspective at EXP, it's just me. But I like to believe I have an army behind me because I want to do a lot of business. 
a massive business, but massive business requires a massive army. Okay, so those are the people, this took a longer than I thought it would, wow. Okay, 52 after the hour. I covered a lot, a lot of talking today. Questions first on this topic, anything about building your team, how to leverage yourself with other people? Any questions on the concept or a specific team member types? Anybody? No. I guess it might be participative. Anybody oh. have any questions? No. Um, I don't. I don't have a question, but I, I do go back to what you're referring to. That you know, the listing agent, or depending on what side of the transaction you're on, you, you're you're pretty much working together. And um, you know, I always see it as when I'm representing a buyer, is the listing agent's my best friend because they're technically the one getting me paid at the end of the day. So I always make sure the relationship is strong with them. And and going back to the team and creating value in your team, uh, the office I was at, there's 115 agents. And out of those 115 agents, no one really knew probate. So anytime there was an issue, they would just, hey, go talk to Peter. And then they would come. And, and you said it, sometimes I don't have the answer, but I'm at least able to give them some form of value and they could leave talking with me knowing more than what they knew uh when we first meet so i i 100 percent agree with that and it's very strong thank you yeah i mean i i know you and i spoke i remember what company you work for but here's what i remember is you're in orange county and if i need somebody to go into Grandy courthouse i might be able to call you talk you into it because you're on my team well i'm actually i'm in san diego Ooh, i'm sorry san diego Yes. Okay. Well, my memory's not so good. I have it in my notes. Let me see here. Right. <laughs> yeah, it's okay. Six one nine. Yeah. No, San Diego. Yeah. yeah but I knew you were in a court that I don't go to often, but yeah. occasionally has something come up, and so I'd put my system. I'd look up who I know in San Diego. Oh, Peter. Oh, yeah. We talked. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And and going to the courthouse and trying to build relationships. Like I've been speaking with the probate examiner. Anytime I could, I'll, I'll call the probate clerk, and just try to get some information. And dude, and that's I want gold. To yeah, I want them to know my name. I want them to become familiar with me. Um, I just was talking with a lady. Her name is Lynette Mary Skull. She's one of the probate examiners on the case. And yeah. all I did is I found some court paperwork. I found her name, called the called it. Super simple, yeah. right? very easy to you do. You can never, literally last night, I have a, a attorney who had a hearing this morning and he had a question. He would have loved to talk to the examiner. And I did show him where the email address was in LA. You get the email address, they're never gonna to respond to you. Mm -hmm. They just never, they just don't typically. But because we call the probate examiner, another answer is the probate attorney, it mm -hmm. is what we call them in in, in uh Los Angeles County and other other um other courts that call them different things. But you're talking about the person who advises the judge, recommends the judge what to do or not to, and they're the recommend the judge, yes, this is good enough, or it's not good enough, and yes, the judge can overrule them, but you know, you can ask them questions and get information that. You can't learn that in law school. No, it, it, it was gold, man. When I was uh, speaking with her, she gave me so much reassurance on, you know, just whatever knowledge I was trying to bring to the table. And she was very nice, very cool to speak with. I'm actually going to give her a call tomorrow just to kind of thank her for everything she's done and how nice she was with me. And she put up with all my questions and Dude, yeah, was gold. gold. It was gold, man. Very nice. Good. So that's networking with people in the courthouse. And that, again, it's a little different in, Cal in Los Angeles. You're not going to get that. That <laughs> That is, I once, so I bought a property where the county administrator attorney uh, showed up. Mm. I had a chance to talk to him, got his name and number. And I did once call him and ask him a question. Again, gold. When you get a chance to talk to a guy who has that kind of, uh, or gal who has that kind of expertise, you're not paying, yes. you know, you call an attorney you you know uh per hour is very expensive and if they can help you it's worth a lot good for you man good for you yeah it was it was really great and another way i just went to an a, a, they had an estate sale i was just driving and i saw an estate sale i was like hey let me just pull over maybe i could find some old comic books or some old skateboarding things that i like but as i was there i started talking to the lady who was throwing the sale got to meet her and i saw i told her how professional her work is i liked how she was working how she priced everything and I got her business card. I've already called her twice. I've talked to her. And I'm, and hopefully, I don't have any business for her now. But like you said earlier, you just, when the time comes and you have that opportunity, 
I'm going to go to her right away. Exactly. Exactly. Good. I looked at I had that in my list. Estate sales, staging companies, junk out companies. Yes. Right. So I I, I used the one eight hundred guy check one time, and I took a video with me and the guys in front of the truck in front of the house. They're glad to do it, and that and because they went on their social media, they're you know big franchise. I got a bunch of views my video because of that. So um, it was fun. It was also fun to do. That's the key thing is do stuff you enjoy. Okay, I'm gonna wrap up here, um, just because I kind of run out of time and I have a five o'clock meeting uh, uh, booked. So. Let's wrap this up just real fast. I'm going to give you a couple of resources. If you want to join this call, if you're on the replay or online and you want to come in um, live next week, you can register at probatemastery.com and that'll take you to an Eventbrite page. You fill out the information and you can come in live and talk, ask questions and all that. And then also an additional free resource is on Facebook, the Probate Weekly Facebook group. It's free, no cost, answer questions, you come in. And with people who post leads around the country for realtors, for attorneys, for vendors, feel free to post any probate related content. I put mine there. But if you have a video or a post just about probate and related, not about your listings, nobody cares, not about your whatever your personal life, but anything about probate, love to have it in the group. And that way we can share and, and support each other's business and learn together and create value and share ideas. Right? I see your video. I get ideas, you see my video, you get ideas, and we work together. Okay, thanks everybody. Pete, thanks for jumping in today and answering some questions. Always great to see you. Attorney you Jack Lapidus, it's nice to see you in between ball games and in between your, your busy travel schedule. He actually does some real estate law along the way. Our favorite attorney, Jack Lapidus, here in Southern California, and his contact info is in the chat box as well as I interviewed him. He's on my um, uh, YouTube channel as well. This is Probate Weekly. We do it every Thursday, 4 p.m. Pacific. 7 p.m. Eastern, live stream on YouTube uh, and Facebook and LinkedIn. Come in live if you want to register at probateweekly.com. Uh, probate you can see the past episodes at episodes.probateweekly.com. Go to the Facebook group. Thank you so much. I'm at Bill Gross Probate and social media and make today your best day ever. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Bill.